Ah, uh, so everybody loves me. Yeah. I'm gonna do that. Quiero tener un posición. So I think we can uh, continue. Okay, so um, all the students can ask any homework questions in their class chat. Okay. And they can also just let us know in there if they finished, if they were able to finish all the homework. Otherwise, they can put their questions, and um, if we need to, we can go over some of the problems from yesterday that they need help on. Okay. <laughs> So they're asking if uh, you can do revision in, I think it was the A, finding the area. Right? Area of the cycle. Area of the cycle. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, there was the last uh, homework, mm -hmm. finding the area of the cycle. Yeah. You guys need help with that one? Yeah, they said if we can uh, do like a quick revision on that one. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, let me try to open it. All right, uh, I think I can go over this one. So, uh, can you guys see my screen right now? Um, yeah. All right, so the problem is uh, the formula to calculate the area of a circumference is, so I think this was a mistake. This is supposed to be area. Oh, wait, sorry. The formula to calculate the area of a circumference is defined as A equals pi times R squared. And for this problem, uh, we're just going to set pi equal to this number right here. And we're going to calculate the area using the formula given in this problem description, which is the area equals pi times r squared, and r is the radius. So the input contains the value of the floating point, which means that we're going to use the float variable for the input. And this is going to be variable r, it says. And we're going to say, present the message A equals, followed by the value of the variable area, um, with four places after the decimal point. So we're probably going to have to use that round function we learned before. And 
Uh, I don't think we need to worry about this. So, so first thing is uh, we need to make a variable called pi. And if we look at the problem, it says pi is equal to 3.14159 just for this problem. Um, I'm sure you guys know that there's more numbers. So you can see right here, I just copy pasted it. Um, so pi is equal to 3.14159. And then now we need the input variable, which is a variable called r. So let's create a variable called r. And remember, it says that this is going to be a value of floating point, which means that it's going to be a float. So let me do that float, open parentheses, and then I'm going to put input. And then it should, let's say, uh, we don't need anything in here. Um, and then, then we need to create a variable called a and then set that equal to this formula right here. So we have variable called a, and it's equal to pi times r squared, right? So I'm just gonna do pi times r times r. And if you wanna do it a different way, you can also do, I'm gonna comment this because it's, it's your choice. You can pick either version. You can do pi times r, and instead of r times r, um, if you guys know, this is r squared, so r to the power of 2, and then this is equal to r to the power of 2 in Python. So after all of this, we want to print out the message a equals, and then the value of the variable. So finally, we're going to print out a equals, and then I need to convert this back into a string, but A equals, and then the string version of A, which stands for the area. So if I try running this, um, let's try putting in two, like it says. Oh, oops, sorry. We're using capital R. I forgot about that. So let's try running it again. Uh, 2.00. And then if I press enter, you guys can see that it printed out 12.56636 is what A equals to. And you can see that output sample has that exactly. So hopefully that makes sense. And if you have any questions, um, you can ask in the general chat or in the chat. And then also, um, if you want to try the second version, I'll show you guys that it also works. So if we put in two points there, there again, you can see we get the same result. And uh, this one is different than this one because we're doing r to the power of 2 instead of r just times r. I, I mean, I guess they're the same thing, but they're, we're writing them differently. So, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Um, should I give you guys a little bit of time to type this out? Or does anyone have any questions? Or can we move on? They are fine, so we can move on. Okay. Um, is there anything else they need help on regarding the homework? Or was this the uh, hardest thing? Yeah, this was the only thing. Okay. So, if you have anything, you can post on the uh, class. All right, then we can start uh, today's lesson. Yeah. <laughs>
So, can everyone see my screen? I just shared again. Uh, yes. <laughs> All right, that's great. So today we're going to be talking about a new data type. So we talked about strings, which were like they have quotation marks and they have like letters. And then we talked about integers or int, and those were just whole numbers like one, five, negative four. All these are whole numbers. And then the last one we talked about was float, and those were decimals, right? Like seven point zero, seven point four. Negative 1.2, those are all decimals and they qualify as float. And today we're going to talk about something called a Boolean. So, Python Booleans are always they're, they're only true or false, they can't be anything else. So, you can see Booleans represent one of two values, true or false. And it says, like in programming, you need to know if an expression is true or false. And it's really important because most of what we're doing with Python is going to be logic related. And for logic, you need to know if something is true or if something is false. And you can see some examples right here. So if I print it out, 10 is greater than 9. Um, 10 is greater than 9. So that would return true. And then it would print out true. And then if I do print 10 equals equals nine, it's gonna print out false because 10 is not equal to nine, right? And then same thing for this third line because 10 less than nine is not true. So that's gonna print out false as well. And we're gonna go into if statements a little bit later, but you can use if statements to say like, if something is true, then we do this. And if it's not true, we're going to go to the else, and it's going to print something else. And you can assign, uh, you can change like a string. So the string hello, you can, if you change it to a Boolean um, using this Boolean casting, um, you can get a value of true or false. And you guys can see that if we set x equal to hello and y equals to 15, and then we change them to booleans. Um, they're either going to be true or false. And if you want to know what they really are, most values are going to be true. As it says, almost any value is evaluated to true if it has some sort of content. So that means that all every string is true. So like ABC would be true. Except empty strings, which means that there's nothing in between these quotation marks. And for numbers, every number is true except for zero. And we don't need to worry about list, tuple, and sets because we haven't learned those yet. And of course, not all values are going to be true. This just means that most of them are. Some of them are going to be false. So as you can see, these are some examples of what would give us false if we change it into a boolean and yeah that's basically it um we're not going to go too deep into this because we haven't learned functions yet so we're going to try our first oh no we're going to move on to operators now so here we are Python operators. So operators, you can imagine, are basically just like your uh, your math, common math operators. So this right here, this plus sign, uh, I'm sure all of you guys have seen it before. This counts as an operator. And Python has a bunch of different types of operators. You can see arithmetic operators, assignment operators, comparison operators, many more. Um, so arithmetic ones are pretty important because a lot of programming is math related and arithmetic is all math. So these are pretty obvious. Addition is just the plus symbol. And you can see the example x plus y. And if you're looking for it on your keyboard, it should be near the zero to the right of zero. And then it should be the equal sign, and then you press shift equal sign to get the plus. 
And for subtraction, uh, it's the same thing like as in math. So it should be pretty obvious too. Um, that one's on the left of the plus sign on your keyboard. So you can go check that out if you want. And then the multiplication operator is the only one that might be a little bit hard to remember, but it's it's just like a star. Um, it's called an asterisk actually. And if you look on your keyboard, it should be shift eight. That's how you access this um, this symbol. And then for division, uh, we use this uh, slash and make sure you're not doing the other slash. This one is starts from the bottom left and goes to the top right. So you can search for that on your keyboard as well if you want. And then modulus is, it might be a little complex at first, but it's just the remainder. So four modulus two would give us zero because four divided by two has no remainder, right? However, if we had five modulus two, then we would get an answer of one because if we divide five by two, we have a remainder of one. And that's the same for like seven divided by five or seven modulus five would equal two, right? Because seven divided by five is one remainder two. So modulus is the same thing as the remainder after you divide those two numbers. And finally, uh, actually not finally, but second to last is expo exponentation. So if we have X and then two asterisks Y, it's the same thing as saying X to the power of Y. So I don't know if you guys remember, we just did the area of the circle problem where we use this. So we had r is equal to this value and y was equal to two. So we said r double asterisk two, which means r squared, right? So that's how we did the part of the area problem. And floor division is a little different than regular division. Whenever you do division with just one of these slashes, it's gonna give you a decimal value, so a float. While floor division, it always gives you the integer uh, less than or equal to whatever you got. So if you have seven divided by three, um, you would get a value of two. And if you had like nine divided by three, uh, two, instead of 4.5 for nine divided by two, you would get four because it rounds down. And then if you had like eight divided by four for floor division, you would still just get an answer of two. So that would be the same as the regular division. And now we have Python assignment operators. These above were arithmetic. So you can think of those as math related. So assignment operators are, um, as it says, they're used to assign values to variables. So you guys have seen the equal sign a lot. So if we say x is equal to five, we're saying that the left part, the name of the variable, is equal to five. So we're setting x equal to five. That's what an, ass an assignment operator does. Um, and you can see these have additions with equal sign, subtraction equal sign, multiplication equal sign. And an example would be x plus equals 3. You can see that it's the same as x equals x plus 3. So if you want to add 3 to the value of x, this is how you would do it. In a short way, you can also write it like this. And it's the same for everything under. So minus equals x minus equals 3 is the same thing as x equals x minus 3. Um, it's the same thing for multiplication, division, modulus as well, and floor division. And you can even do it for exponents. You can see all of these are the same, like in the same format, basically. It's, and these are kind of just short ways of putting these. And then everything under like these parts, you don't need to worry about. Uh, you're not going to see them as often as the stuff above. And then we have Python comparison operators. 
And these are important because they return Boolean values. So there's a big difference between having one equal sign and two equal signs. When you have one equal sign, as we saw up here, we're, we're setting the value of x equal to 5. That's what we're doing with one equal sign. But if we have two equal signs, we're going to be checking if the value on the left is equal to the value on the right. And if it is, it's going to return true because the, the idea that x is equal to y is true, right? But if it's not, it's going to give us false. So you can imagine that if you, whenever you see two equal signs, it's always going to be true or false. And whenever you see one equal sign, it, you're just assigning the value of 5 to x. So you need to make sure you know the difference between a singular equal sign and a double equal sign. And once again, you can stop me at any point if you have any questions, and I'm sure some teacher can answer that for you. Um, so the next comparison operator is if we have something that checks if two things are equal, we obviously need something that checks if they're not equal. And this is pretty easy to remember because it has the equal sign in it. Um, but not equal is just the exclamation point before the equal sign. And then if x is not equal to y, then it's going to give us a value of true and then if x is equal to y this is going to give us a value of false and then the rest of these should be a little easier to understand because greater than so if you have x equals 10 and y equals 5 10 is greater than 5 so that's going to give us true right and then for less than if we have x is equal to 10 again and then y equals 5 that's going to be false because 10 is not less than and then we have greater than or equal to, which is the same thing, but it's also checking if it's equal. And then we have less than or equal to, which is the same thing, but we're adding the equal sign. And then we have the Python logical operators. And these are really important, um, especially the easiest to understand should be the not operator. So if you have not of true, then it's going to be false. If you have not false, it's going to be true. So whatever Boolean value you have, whether that's true or false, not is just going to give you the other one. So if you have true and you put not before it, it's going to be not true, which is false. And if you have not false, that's going to equal true. And then we're going to talk about and. So and is only true if both statements on either side, so you can see x is less than 5 and x is less than 10. So if both x is less than 5 and x is less than 10 is true, this entire thing is going to give us true. But if, if one of them is false, either one, then it's going to be false. And if both are false, it's going to be false too. And then or is a little different. Or only returns true if one or more of the statements are true. So if x is less than 5 or if x is less than 4, then it's going to give us true. So if one of these is true, it's going to be as true. If both of these are true, it's also going to be true. But if none of them are true, that's when it's going to be false. And then you can also use uh, identity operators. So if you have two Python objects, um, I don't think we're going to use this yet. So don't worry about it if you don't really understand like the concepts of objects. But is, you can say x is y, and if x literally is y, like if they're the same object, it's going to return true. And if x is not y, then it's going to be this this is what you would use to make it true. Um, and then I think everything else uh, is going to be go gone over later. So we're going to start our first um, little project slash assignment. So this is the problem we're going to 
do. <laughs> so Python data types and operator. This problem is called the weird number. And we write a program that accepts an integer n and computes the value of n plus nn plus nnn. And this this just means that it's like if you look at the examples, if we input five, then you're gonna have five plus fifty-five plus five 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 equals this. And then if we have an input number of four, then we're gonna have four plus four four plus four 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 equals four nine two. So there's a few things we need to do for this one. And firstly, um, we're gonna start with, let's start with the input number, n. And it's gonna be an integer number because we're, as you can see there, it says accept an integer. Int, open parentheses, and it's gonna be an input. And then, oh, actually, we're, we're not going to use the input as an int yet because we to make this number 55, uh, we can't add n plus n, right? Because that's going to give us 10. So we need to add n plus n when there's strings because if there's strings, it'll give us, if we add 5 plus 5, as strings, it's going to give us 55. But if we add 5 plus 5 as integers, it's going to give us 10. And then, so what we can do is there's a few things we can do. Um, we can print out. Actually, uh, I think. Yeah, so. What we can do is we can print out n. Okay, sorry. I'm gonna create a variable called sum, and this is gonna equal that sum we're making. So it's gonna equal 615 for the first example and 492 for the second example. So, Firstly, what we need is we need to get this number first. So five, and that's just gonna be our input number. That's why I said int of n. And then the second number is 55. So we need to add n plus n as strings first, then convert that into an integer. So, so we add n plus n as strings, which will give us 55 if we input five and then convert that to a number. And we can do the exact same thing for three digits. So n plus n plus n, right? And finally, we're gonna print this all out. First, we're gonna print n, and then it says to use a, I'm gonna use the comma method. And then you need a plus sign. Then we have n plus n. So right now I'm printing out this line. So, oops. So this part, n is the number five that we're printing out. This right here, the addition symbol is this one right here. And remember when you're printing using commas instead of plus signs in between the things you're printing, these commas will always have a space, which is why I don't need a space like right here because the commas automatically give me a space. And then we're gonna add one more plus sign for the triple n, so n, n, n. And then we're gonna need the equal sign. And finally, we need to we need to print out the sum at the very end, which is why I converted it to a string because the sum is a number, right? So we need to convert it to a string so we can add all these together. Or actually, if you're using commas, I don't think you do. Uh, let's just see if this works. So let's try example one with this. We're putting a five in. 
And as you guys can see, it printed out flawlessly and it's exactly the same as this. If we rerun the code, uh, we can test, out, test it out with the number four, which is example two. And you guys can see that gave us the second line right here. So yeah, that's it for this one. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask in the general chat. Um, I'll give you guys some time to actually type this out. And let me know if I'm going too quickly or you have any questions, of course. And let me know when we can move on to the next part. Yeah, so we can move on. All right. Sounds good. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a series of more problems. So if I can pull these up. All right, more Python data types and operator practice problems. So the first problem is pretty simple. Um, we're going to write a Python program to convert temperature from Fahrenheit to Celsius degrees. So uh, obviously, the input is going to be the temperature in Fahrenheit. So in this example, I guess someone inputted 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And it automatically converts it. It says 212 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 100 degrees in Celsius. So um, if you guys don't know the, the formula to convert... Fahrenheit to Celsius, that's okay, because um, I don't have it memorized either. But it's 
It's basically whatever you put in minus 32 times 5 over 9. So I'll write it down somewhere. So it's it's not like... Yeah, I'll, I'll just write it down so that you guys have it. Um, so I guess I'll create a variable called f representing Fahrenheit. And this is going to be inputted in as a float because, you know, degrees can have decimals too. I mean, it's not always a whole number. And then all we need to do is put this into the formula. So the formula is F minus 32. And I'm going to put this in parentheses because uh, order of operations is pretty important. And then that's going to be multiplied by 5 divided by 9. And the reason why I chose these numbers is that's just how the formula works. Uh, so if you don't know it, now you do. And then let's print it in the format they want you to print it in. So 212 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 100 in Celsius. Print F comma. And you don't have to put this space here. I just like doing that to make my code look a little cleaner. Like this space here, this space here. You don't really need these. Um, I just like doing it because it's easier to see different parts of my code. So first thing is this. That's printing. And then next we need degrees. Fahrenheit is equal to, and then C is how many degrees Celsius, and then we'll say C in Celsius. All right, so let's run this to see if it works. Uh, the number they tested out was 212 to 12. And you guys can see 212 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 100 in Celsius, exactly what's listed right here. Um, and if you didn't know, we can try running it. 32 degrees Fahrenheit is actually zero degrees Celsius. And it does calculate that correctly too. So this is this is the next. I mean, this is the answer to the next question. So if you have any questions, you can ask again, and let me know when I can move on.
We can continue. Okay. Uh, let's continue now. So, we have another exercise. Write a Python program that reads a number in inches, converts it to meters. So, um, this is yet again another conversion problem. And of course, uh, luckily they gave us the conversion. I don't know, I did not memorize this. But one inch is equal to 0 0.0254 meters. So the input value is going to be how many inches, and your output should be look like this. So 1,000 inch or inches is 25.4 meters. It's going to look extremely similar to the program we had before. So we start with uh, inches. So maybe I'll name this inch. I'll just name it I, actually. And this is going to be a float. Our input, and then so one inch is that many meters. So if we want meters from inches, we just multiply. Uh, we multiply the number of inches by this value right here. That and that will give us the number of meters. And I'm just going to test this out to see if it's actually printing out the right value. So, a thousand, let's see if it prints out. Alright, so this worked, but we need to print it out in this format. So, let's put it in this format. So, I inches and then is. meters. So i inches is m meters. Let's see if this works. 1000. You can see it prints it out. 1000 inches is 25.4 meters. That's exactly what we printed here. Um, hopefully there aren't that many questions for this one because it's very similar to the one we just did. And of course, uh, let me know when I can move on. And when you guys are finished, you guys are doing great so far. Only up. Everything in the speed of time.
Yeah, so we can move on. Okay. Um, so the next problem on this problem set is to write a Python program that reads an integer between 0 and 1000, and it adds all the digits in the integer. So an example would be we input 565, and if we add up 5 and 6 and 5 again, so 5 plus 6 is 11, 11 plus 5 is 16, we get a result of 16. This one is going to be a little bit more difficult because it has more steps. And so um, I'm going to create a variable called num, set it equal to an integer variable, and that's going to be our input. So it's guaranteed that we're reading an integer, which is why I put int right here. And then next thing we need to do is we need to find the sum of the digits of these integers, right? So to find the sum, we're going to be using the modulus function. And so first we're setting the sum equal to zero. And this is just called declaring the variable because uh, we're just setting sum equal to zero. And then we're going to be adding each digit individually. And then we're going to first, um, to add five right here, there's something really cool we can do with the modulus function. And if you don't remember what that is, it is the remainder. So if you divide 565 by 10, the remainder you get is going to be 5, which is the unit digit or the first digit. So we add and set it equal to num modulus 10. And then after we do that, To do it one more time, we need to divide this, divide number by 10, but we need to round down because if we divide 565 by 10, we get a result of 56.5, right? But we don't need that 5 anymore, so we round down to 56, and from there we need that 6. And we do the same exact thing where we... I'm going to copy paste because I'm a little lazy, but we're going to do the modulus again, and the modulus will get rid of this 5 temporarily, and then give us that 6. Then we do it one more time, and then finally we're going to add that 5 at the very end. Um, and it's going to do this just one more time. Then we finally print... Um, again, I'm just going to check if this prints out the right value, just in case it might not work. And so you can see 565, I put it, and then it prints out 16, which is correct. Now we just need to format it correctly. So the sum of the digits in, and then num. num is so the sum of the digits in num is the sum so let's see if this works oh okay so this is something i forgot to consider um you see how we're changing num each time by dividing by 10 but we want to print out the original value so i'm going to create a new variable um, called t or temp. Uh, this is going to stand for temporary and then change everything to temp. 
but then we're still going to print out the original number. Temp is the thing we're changing, but in the beginning, you see we're changing temp equal to, I mean, we're setting temp equal to 565. So if I run this, 565, now that I run it, it says the sum of the digits in 565 is 15. That's actually not correct, which is weird, but let's see. Oh, uh, it's because we need to change this to temp as well. That's a mistake on my end. And then now that we run it again, um, it should work correctly. And whenever you see repeated lines like this, like this is, it all looks repeated, right? Like we're doing the same thing. Um, you can imagine in the future, we might be using like a loop. When we learn that, we may be able to use a loop. And this one is gonna be a lot harder than the other ones. So if you have any questions, um, definitely make sure you ask them so you really understand what's happening. So yeah. Try this on your own, and you can ask questions if you want. So they, uh, they are asking if you can repeat uh, this particular example. All right, that's, yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, so, so this one, uh, first we need to, of course, we need to get the input. So the number that we're inputting is 565. And we're gonna set that equal to something called num. But because we want to print out the original number at the end, but our algorithm that we're gonna make is gonna change this number, we're gonna to have to um, we're gonna to have to set num equal to a new variable called temp, which stands for temporary, which means like it's it's going to like, it's a variable we're gonna change. The variable we're gonna change is temp and num we're gonna leave alone because that's the original value, right? And then we we're declaring the variable called sum, which is going to, this is the, this value right here, but instead of adding it all at once, we're adding it one by one. So we're gonna add five first, then we're gonna add six and then five. But to do this, we need to, so this is how you get the, the value of the digit. And then this is how you get rid of the digit. 
So let me try resharing my screen to uh, something that might make more sense. Um, so can everyone see this black screen that I just opened? Yes. All right. So we start with the value five, six, five, right? And then let me try, sorry. Let me try doing this. All right. So now we can see my code and this. So we start with 565. Five. That's what num is equal to. And then temp is also going to equal 565 because we set that equal to temp. And then we set sum equal to zero at first. And then the first thing we're going to do is temp modulus 10, right? And if you divide 565 by 10, your remainder is going to equal 5, right? And that's this right here. It's going to give you 5. And so if we add this to the sum, then that's going to now equal 5. And then, then we're going to get rid of that digit, which is this sign right here. And you're going to see that if we divide this, sorry, my handwriting might not be very good, but hopefully it's readable. You're going to get a value of 56. And then now temp is equal to 56. And then we're going to repeat this process. So 56 modulus 10. So you divide by 10, and 56 divided by 10 is 5 with a remainder of 6, right? So your remainder is 6, and of course, that's this value right here. And then this value is going to be added to the sum, so you get 11. And then once again, we want to get the next value, like the next digit, so we need to divide again. So 56 divided by 10 is equal to 5, because we round down. Remember, if we have two of these, sorry, two of these, then we have to round down. And now temp is equal to 5. And 5 modulus 10 is going to be 0 remainder 5, because 10 goes into 5 0 times with the remainder 5. So the remainder is 5, and then we add that remainder again to sum, which is going to give us 16. That is the answer, and we're going to print that out. Um, so you can check out the live lecture notes. Uh, I think David did a pretty good job of noting this stuff. Uh, hopefully that made sense. And you can ask more questions if you want. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, we we can move on. All right. So this is the last problem from this set that we're gonna do. Um, there's a few more problems, but this is gonna be your homework. So number four is gonna be. Write a Python program to convert minutes into a number of years and days. So this is going to um, use a lot of math because we need to do, of course, more conversions to years and days. Um, and the method we're going to use for this is we're basically going to divide the number of minutes and convert that to the number of years, and then whatever's left over, we're going to use that and calculate the number of days, and then we don't have to worry about what's left over after that, because this is just an approximation of only years and days. We don't need to worry about anything else. And um, if you guys aren't really sure how to convert this, um, I did some notes right here so i don't know if this is like visible but uh if you have minutes given to you you can convert it like this um for me this is easy to understand um so hopefully this makes a little more sense so whenever we multiply uh, minutes and we want to convert to hours we multiply by one over 60 so one hour per 60 minutes and you can see the minutes cancel out and then you can do the same for an hour in a day, the hours cancel, and then the days cancel, and we're left with 600, I mean, yeah, 600,000 years, and then, uh, I don't know, it's 60 times 24 times 365 is. But that's going to be a very, that's going to be a very small number. So that's why this number right here is really large. But hopefully this makes sense. Um, this is kind of what we're going to do. So um, we're going to start with, let's see, number of minutes. So m i n for minutes and then uh let's first find out how many years are in this amount 
So Y R is usually the standard um uh, acronym is what it's called or it's just this is what I'm gonna say for years is Y R or this is what I'm gonna use. Um and to divide you I mean to make it into years you need to divide by this right here. So divide by sixty times twenty four times three sixty five. So whatever min is, divide and in parentheses sixty times twenty five times three sixty five. It's gonna be a really large number. And there's gonna be a little problem. I'm just gonna print this out to see what happens to show you guys. But you're gonna spot a problem probably. So I can copy the number of minutes, this large number, press enter. And we can see that we get six years, but it's 6.574, blah, 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 whatever it says. And so the mistake we made right here is we need two division symbols to make this integer division. Uh, we want to round down because we're going to use the leftover for the days. So we want to round down, which is why we have two. And now if we run it again, you can see we just get a value of six, which means that this is working correctly. And whenever you see me printing like just a single variable, uh, I'm just testing it out so that uh, just to check if it works. You don't have to exactly do that if you don't want to. But it's always nice to check if different parts of your program work. So uh, the next thing we need is we need the leftover. So um, let's see. I'm going to create a new variable called remainder. Or I'll just do rem. Uh, just think about it as remainder. And then this time it's going to be min modulus. And then this right here. So this is gonna give us uh, that 6.58 blah, 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 that point, all of those things after it, it's gonna give us that in minutes. Or sorry, not in minutes. Oh yeah, actually, yeah, in minutes. It's gonna give us that much in minutes. And then we can convert that remainder into days. So to convert into days, um, as you can see here, all we need to is to divide by 60 times 24. Is all we need to divide by. So, oops. So days or day equals uh, rem, so the remaining, and then divide that by 60 times 24. And then, um, again, I'm just going to print it out to see if we're getting the right values. You don't have to do this. This is just like a check. And 210 is the number of days it says. So we can see that it works correctly. Now we just need to print it out uh, correctly. So min, and then minutes. Is approximately all right. Year, year, not tears. Year, and this. So I'm gonna run this. Uh, input this big number of minutes and we can see it prints out pretty much identical to this part so again um let me know when you are finished and when we can move on you can ask questions if you want and you need love sorry can you repeat that And we do the instruction to them.
Yeah, uh, I can definitely repeat that. So, um, someone just asked if I could repeat to, like, how to get the number of years. And so, uh, this, this part right here is how I did it. So, let me erase this and make this the number that we had before. Or actually, I'll just erase all of this. Let me just create a new thing. Oops, I'm not sharing my screen correctly. All right, here we go. So we're starting off with, looks like 3,456,789 minutes. And uh, in math, if you want to convert something to something else, it's really easy to use this strategy. So one hour is equal to 60 minutes. And so we can cancel these out. And now we have this many hours divided by 60. It would equal the amount of hours. And if we want the number of days, in one day, there is 24 hours. So then we cancel this out, and this is the number of days. And then we're finally we have the number of years. And there is in one year, there are 350 and 65 days. So all of this in total, if we cancel everything out. This means that this huge number, 3,456,789, it, when it's divided by these, which is another big number, it's going to give us the number of years. But because it's giving us more than we need so it's going to give us a value like 6.58 dot 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 and in here it's telling us that we need to give the number of years and days and it's also an estimate so to find the number of days you need to use this remainder convert it back into minutes or instead of converting back into minutes we need to get the number of minutes that's left and then convert that into the number of days so that we can find out this value right here. Um, let me know if you want me to repeat that again.
So we can uh, move on. All right, let's move on. So all of that, and we're we're on to a new topic. We're gonna talk about Python if else statements. So this is uh, you, if you notice, we haven't really used any Boolean values yet. And if you need a quick review, Boolean is true and false. It's a new data type, and it's only equal to true and false. So if and else statements basically rely on Booleans, because if something is true, then you want to do something. And if it's not true, you want to do something else. So these Python conditions and if statements use uh, certain logical conditions. Um, and they're obviously from mathematics. So equals is pretty self-explanatory remember i told you if it has two equal signs it it's uh it's comparing the two and will give us a true or false value and not equals is an exclamation point equal sign and less than greater than less than or equal to greater than or equal to should be pretty self-explanatory and the formatting of if statements is extremely important to note so make sure you have this down. So first, um, this is not really part of the if statement, but we're declaring A first equal to 33. Then we're declaring B equal to 200, right? So if B is greater than A, and then, so this is the condition that's going to give us a boolean value right it's going to give us true or false depending on the values of b and a and then we're going to have a colon after that check so if there's a colon after um you need indentations to show what is part of the if statement so an indentation is basically just a, a big space you can see how there's a bunch of white space on the left of this print statement and that means that there's an indentation there. And to do an indent on your computer, um, if you look next to the letter Q, on the left of Q should be tab, and that lets you indent. And so because B is greater than A, so 200 is obviously bigger than three, 33, right? So this is gonna print B is greater than A. And you can see indentation is really big. Um, Python relies on indentation, also known as white space at the beginning of a line. So this white space before this print statement is indentation. And it's to define scope in the code. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. Um, the scope is basically just what is inside of this if statement. So if B is greater than A, the things I wanna do if B is greater than A, I'm going to indent in one place. 
And then if I don't want to do it, if B is greater than A and I just want to do it like no matter what, then I can remove the indent and it's not going to be part of that, that block of code. And so you can see without indentation, you'll get an error because it doesn't have anything. If you just have this print statement without an indent, there's nothing that that's inside of this if statement. If you want to put something inside the if statement, you need to have indents after. And then obviously there's more con than one condition. So if only checks one condition, right? But if that condition is false, there's something we can do called an L if. You can imagine this as an else if. So if previous conditions were not true, then try this condition. So if B is greater than A, print B is greater than A. Note that there's a colon and there's an indentation, which is part, means that this is part of this if statement. So if this is false, then we're going to move on to this. So L if A is equal to B, colon, indentation, then we're going to print A and B are equal. But if this is true and we print B is greater than A, it's not going to go here because this is only if this is false. It's going to enter this part. And the L if is, it's checking once, once again, another condition, right? After we check the first one, but an L statement, it's checking no condition. If everything above, so if this is all false and it never goes to these print statements, it goes to the else and it says, okay, else. So if nothing is true above, then we print A is greater than B. And else statements are very similar to if and elif, except it does, has no condition, right? It still has the colon, it still has the indentation. It has all that. So there, here's another example. Um, A is equal to 200, B is equal to 33. If B is greater than A, print B is greater than A. Um, you can see B is not greater than A, so it's going to go to else. I'm just going to say print and it's going to print B is not greater than A. Um, and we're not going to talk about those. These are just kind of like shortcuts. But the AND keyword is really useful for if statements. If you have two conditions you want to test, and you want both of them to be true in order to print this, then you can say if A is greater than B, and C is greater than A, then we're going to print. So if only one of them are true, it's not going to print. Both of them have to be true on the left and right side. The OR keyword is a little different. So if A is greater than B or if A is greater than C. So only one of them needs to be true and it'll give us a value of true. So if this part is false, but this part is true, it's going to give us true. And if this part is true, this part is false, it's going to give us true. If both of them are false, that's the only time when it's going to give us false. And you can also do something called a nested if. And it's an if statement inside of an if statement. So again, you'll see that everything that's inside of this if statement has this indent, right? And this in if statement is inside of this one. And so this condition or this statement, this line is under both this if statement and this one. You can see the indent, it's double indented first here and then here. And so is this else, it's also gonna be double indented. First indent right there, second indent right here. And you can see all of these line up, right? Print if else, they line up. These prints line up. And so yeah, indentation is extremely important. Um, so this is kind of useless. I don't think I've ever used this, but if 
if you just want to write an if statement and then you don't know what to put under yet, you can just write pass and it'll just skip over and basically do nothing. Because if you don't put anything here, you'll get an error. Like you need something here. So pass is just a word you can use to say like, like, okay, I, I don't know what to put here yet, but yeah. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, you can always ask questions if something isn't making sense. For now, I'm going to move on to uh, yet another assignment. And by the way, these assignments, um, five, six, and seven, you're going to do for homework. So have fun with those. And so our assignment right now is going to be Python if else section. It's going to be like kind of a continuation. This looks very familiar, right? So we input our name. So this is Chuyon's, Chuyon teacher's name. And then English score 90, math score 100, science score 85, history score, blah, blah, blah. And this is what we're gonna print. So this part, it looks familiar. We've done it before. We've also done the average, but the most important part is printing out the grade. So if you're not sure how the grading system works, Everything above a 90% is an A, and then anything above an 80% is a B, anything above 70% is a C, and anything under or above 60% is a D, everything under that is an F. So the way we establish what the grade is, is we're going to use if statements to check the average. So if the average is greater than 90, then we know the grade is an A. So that's how we're going to do this program. Um, hold on. There we go. Okay. So, so the first thing we need is the, the input part. So name equals input uh in oops, input your name and notice i didn't put any casting we don't need to convert this into anything because you know names are always strings they're not going to be numbers or anything like that and then i english i'm going to do eng which stands for English. And I'll say, since these are scores, I'll say int input English score. And then math equals int. So we're going to do the same thing for all of these different subjects. Math score. And science is another one. Science score, history score, I'm going to use HIS for history, history score. And now that we have all our inputs, we can finally print out the report card. So first we're going to print the line, this line right here, that says the name and then apostrophe s report card. So name plus apostrophe s report card. And then I'm gonna input my name, hello Su Wu. And then I'll just put in some random numbers. And then it says hello Su Wu's report card. So that prints correctly. Now we're going to print each of the subjects. So first is English. And for these, I'm going to use commas because uh, I think it's easier. So in this case, I use a plus sign because we're using strings. And when, whenever we use a comma, although it puts these together, it adds a space and if you look here we're we need to add this apostrophe s without a space which means that we cannot use a comma for this one and we need to use this plus sign 
And then for other subjects, like math, we're going to do the same thing, math, print, and then science, it's going to be sci. And then finally, we have history. And then uh, now we need to find the average, right? So I'm going to abbreviate AVG. Um, just know that means average. So we have to add up all our scores, English, math, science, history. And there's four subjects. We divide this by four. And notice how we don't use the double one because this one we we're fine with it being a decimal. You can see 92.5, that's a decimal. Now we're gonna print this average. Average is comma AVG. Oops. And then we finally need to determine what grade we have, right? And this is probably the most important part or hardest part. So our average, if it's greater than 90, that means it's an A. So that's, we're first gonna do that. If average, I cannot type, is greater than or equal to 90, colon, enter. And for me, when I press enter, it automatically plays, do you see this white space here? It automatically indents for me. And then I'm going to say print, and then, yeah, grade is A. And then when I press enter, it's going to give indent me again, but I don't want to add anything else. So I'm going to press backspace to erase that indent. And then I'm going to have an else if. So if the average is not greater than 90, then what's the next grade value? It's B, right? It's a B. And Bs are greater than 80 and less than 90. But we already checked that if it's greater than 90, if that part is false, then it's already assuming that it's less than 90. Per, uh, 90. So we're going to print grade is B for when it's greater than or equal to 80. And then we can do the same for all of our other grades. So let's see. Next thing is when your grade is C. And then next thing is when your grade is a D. Grade is D. And finally, we're gonna just do an else. If if your grade is none of these, it has to be an F, right? So we're gonna print grade is F. So else, grade is F. And I'm going to run this. So first, my name is Hamosu Wu. Uh, I suck at English, so I'm gonna say 50. Math, I'll say 100. Science, 90. History, I'll say 80. And then you can see the average we got is 80. And because 80 is within the range of a B, it tells us our grade is a B. And I will now put this in the live lecture notes. So you can check that code out in the live lecture notes section of Discord if you want. And let me know if you want to see a portion of the code because I can't fit all this uh, on one screen. So if you want to see like a part of the code or you want me to scroll up or something, just let me know.
All right, I believe uh, that is all the time we have today. Um, and Serena will be telling you guys about your homework. Okay, so um, like we showed earlier, you guys can finish the rest of the operator homework. Um, questions five to seven, I'll send it in the Discord homework channel. And then we have more if else statement problems. Um, there's one, two, we have four more and one of them has a challenge as well. So you guys can try the challenge, but if it's too hard, we can always go over it on Monday. Yeah, so you guys did really uh, great this week and... Um, hopefully next week we'll be able to split off into small groups and um, we can learn even more. Yeah, do you guys have any questions? Any question? Uh, no. <clears throat> uh, so they, uh, no, no question. Okay. Then I think we're done for today. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. See you next Bye. week. Bye. Bye. Uh, good job.